No medical school in America is teaching visceral fat. 6,000 people, we tracked every chronic disease that they had. Every one of them either got substantially better or completely reversed once they got rid of their visceral fat. This guy was a distance runner. He had a sizable amount of visceral fat. In two months, he substitutes sprinting. And then look at the dramatic wow, yeah. uh, elimination of visceral fat. This guy has uh, MS. In nine months, look at the change in his face. And his MS symptoms are now basically in remission. Why go to a gym if you're not going to improve? And what we found is the ability to induce muscle protein synthesis hypertrophy wanes in proportion to visceral fat. I had one client was 60 four years old, infertile, got rid of his uh, visceral fat, called me up and he said, you're not going to believe it, doc, got my wife pregnant. So the fountain of youth really is getting rid of this visceral fat. The thing that we found is like we can get guys when they get rid, like these are guys in their 50s and 60s, they'll have ED with all that visceral fat. Mm. And they, they get rid of their visceral fat and they get their erectile function back, which is great. They I like need- the uh, sign that you have going on over <laughs> yeah. here with the so, arm. <laughs> but it's for a point because the other thing that happens- Just try to stay get, close to the microphone. When you get rid of visceral fat, you get a bounce. So when you were 15, Mark Bow 15, <laughs> your boner bounced like this. You get this. a little bounce out of it. Yeah, man. And so my clients, they get a teeny bounce and they gets bigger and bigger. So that is a something bounce. nobody else is getting. Mm. You get rid of that visceral fat and you open up the arteries and you get the, every heartbeat, you get this massive bounce. Now it starts out really weak and it just continues to grow. So that's cool content. I don't know, might be a little... A little edgy for your show. I don't That's know. Not edgy enough. No. Trust me. <laughs> Perfect. You can get edgier if you want okay. to. Okay. <laughs> well, no, we can yeah, get in. We at, can get into it. At fifteen, there's so much blood in there that you think the whole thing's going to explode. <laughs> it's, it's I know true, one guy who actually ran to his mother one time with that. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> I wasn't fifteen. I was eleven. Oh, <laughs> or ten. I didn't know what a boner was. She had to tell me. Oh god, that's that sounds awesome. real weird, dog. <laughs> but, but, Context. I was scared. That's awesome. That's awesome. Everybody back up. (laughs) But yeah, blood flow is key. That's a great story. (laughs) It's getting lower now. (laughs) All right. Visceral or fat? Uh, How did you, uh, you know, get into all this? Did you discover it or somebody else discover it? What's going on with visceral fat? Yeah. So um, it goes back to really about 2013. And uh, um, even before that, I was just an overweight, uh, heavy, fat doctor with a lot of medical problems. And uh, like ED, large prostate, eczema all over my body. Mm. I had uh, gastroesophageal reflux, a heartburn. I was on three different acid suppressant medications. And I was having to get scoped with a you know big fiber optic scope every three months for cancer surveillance. So I had a diagnosis of what was called Barrett's esophagus. So it's not just a little casual heartburn. My, I had metaplastic changes inside the cells of my esophagus that were precancerous. So every three months, uh, I had to have the scope to see if I had converted to cancer. And then they would start chemo, radiation, or some kind of cancer there. So I was like, dang, you know, uh, living my life in my, my 30s, for when eventually I'm going to get esophageal cancer, which has a high mortality. And I also had uh, uh, high blood pressure. I had clogged arteries, restless leg syndrome, and uh, obstructive sleep ap- apnea, uh, terrible back pain, uh, debilitating back pain. So I was falling apart. How much did you weigh at that time? Did you? Um, you know, I wasn't, you know, obese. I was probably about um, 100 you know, 170, 100, 168. One of my photographs right there, actually, there on the left, uh, I was 165. And so you're not um, super heavy. Nope. Nope. You'd sick. look at me. Uh, but if I, you know, if I was on the beach, you'd, you'd just say dad bod, you know, not uh, not a beast guy. But there I am filled with uh, all those medical conditions. And I I meet this, uh, this young guy, 17 years old in the hospital gym. He looked, I thought he was like, 24 or so, um, and he was, you know, busting out a great workout. He was doing a good job. And uh, another big, huge uh, bodybuilder came out and said, that's an impressive amount of weight you're lifting. Uh, you live for one of the universities around here? He goes, no, I, I don't go to school anymore. I just work. 
And he goes, what do you do? And he goes, I do executive health. So I, I got interested in this guy. And, I, and he said, well, if you want to lose that gut of yours, I'm like, what do I got to do to look like you? And he goes, um, you got you to gotta cut, cut out carbs and start eating fermented foods. So this is like 2009. So it's paleo, you know, I didn't know anything about paleo. He told me that word and eat fermented foods. So key to what I think happened to me, unlike what happens to a lot of other people that tried paleo and keto, were these fermented foods. So I start on these fermented foods. I hated them. <laughs> I was like, I got to get rid of all these medical problems. And uh, well, actually, I did it to get rid of my weight. I didn't, he, that kid didn't tell me, I call him a kid. He goes, he just said, get rid of your dad bod, that gut. Um, you know, eat these fermented foods and cut out, you know, processed foods and car carbohydrates. So I did. And one year later, I wasn't even expecting this. I'm peeing in my toilet. And normally it would dribble. I mean, you got to know what it's like to be a man and have pee dribbling out of your body. I mean, it's so demasculating. Yeah, that sounds It impressive. dribbles. And it would, I'd wet my pants. I'm freaking 48. I'm wetting my pants, walking away like some kind of great grandpa. And I'm waking up four or five times a night to pee. So um, I was really ticked off, but I wasn't expecting anything to really turn around other than maybe <laughs> I would lose this big, big gut that I had. But one, one year, that thing, you know, your disease comes on so slow, Mark, that you don't really pay attention. You don't see that your life is falling apart, that you're, you're accumulating all these kind of conditions. And the opposite happens. If uh, you start getting better, you, you may not see improvement. It's slow. It, it comes on slow as well. So there I am one year later. I'm now peeing in the toilet like I used to when I was like a teenager. I'm making noise again. I'm making bubbles. I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> a stream. <laughs> and so I re recognized I wasn't waking up anymore to, uh, to pee four or five times a night. And uh, now I jokingly tell my clients and people, I can pee over the hood of a car. And when I go into a public bathroom, did you start to clean the bath, the, the you know the toilet <laughs> with your piss? <laughs> yeah, yeah man. That too. I saw, yeah, yeah. The poop off there. Yeah, yeah. That's power. So much fun. That power. So <laughs> the pressure uh, I, wash. Yeah. I go into and when I use a public bathroom. I do not use a urinal. I go into a toilet. I purposely create Niagara Falls, <laughs> and I see these older guys looking. <laughs> they they do. It's like. You know, it's like weird, you know, public subway stuff. They're looking like, who the heck is that? And they see this gray-haired guy walking out. And it's, it's this kind of look of like, damn. Like he must have played that yeah. on his phone. I was like, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, they're like, wish I could have that. And, you know, I, uh, I'm so happy that all those medical problems, whatever. but that's how, you know, the back end of the, the answer to your question, that's how I got to visceral fat because I'd so improved. And none of it, none of it was from medical school. So I'm this pedantic, arrogant, I'll just say I was an arrogant ER doctor. And uh, I just assumed everything that they taught us in medical school was correct. If it wasn't taught in medical school, it wasn't worth uh, a darn. So basically they teach you, if somebody comes to you and they, t they ask you about something that you'd never heard about in medical school, it's just not true. Just be nice to them. And so that was my mentality. But my experience was uh, I cut out these processed carbs. I started eating this fermented food. Every medical problem goes away. I'm like, I have to become a researcher and figure out, because my whole life changed. You know, I didn't just shred some weight. I mean, I'm telling you, I'd be, I, every medical problem I had went away. So I meet this, uh, this Chinese-American doctor, Dr. Zhang. And he said, oh, shall I tell you, it's visceral fat. Oh. You guys... You got to come get scanned. So I'm like, okay. So he scanned me and uh, I, you know, I was so much better. And, but I'm laying in this scanner, Mark. And this, he had a tech who was also Chinese. And uh, the, when I, when I was being pulled out of that scanner, I said, God, I'm going to be so upset if I got this damn visceral fat. I don't know what, I'm going to be so upset after doing all this stuff. And uh, that the, the tech looked down and he goes, he says, I don't know who you are, but you are obscenely healthy. And so they show, showed my skin. I had like very little visceral fat. 
And uh, so that's how I got started. And we studied it for the next seven years. Dr. Zeng and I invited me to his medical, his research practice. We got a grant from the National Science Foundation back in 2015. And uh, we, we were funded uh, $1.2 million. And uh, we scanned 6,000 Americans uh, studying one at a time. What happens with uh, visceral fat? What do you got to do? You know, uh, we looked at sprinting. We looked at jogging. We looked at different foods. We d- looked at lifestyle. We looked at alcohol. It was just so interesting to do that. And um, so we did that for seven years. And we learned, we became the experts at how to get rid of visceral fat. <laughs> and uh, uh, we decided, you know, we the, the National Science Foundation, you know, it's a, it's a government you know, funded organization, very interesting. They are legit uh, Americans that really scientists that they're like, we we want to give this money to people that have good ideas, but there's one other condition to it. You can't just have a good idea. You got to be, you got to be able to make money off this. Because if you don't make money, your good idea is going nowhere. So that's where we sucked. We were doctors. We didn't know how to make money. We were giving these scans away for free. <laughs> and, uh, um, we didn't know how to charge and, you know, model it in a way to, to make money. So, you know, COVID came along. We'd gone through all our bank accounts. We couldn't afford to pay for our employees and, and the scanner. So it just got all shut down. Super sad. We, we were in essential business practice. And so um, I retooled and now I figured out a model to how to optimize human beings and make money off of it. And now I want to spread it, spread the insights and strategies to other physicians. And you don't even have to be a physician. You just have to be a human being that wants to help people out because everything we found out to improve um, and reduce visceral fat doesn't need prescription drugs, doesn't need medical procedures. It's all lifestyle. So health coaches, personal trainers, um, just awesome, you know, men and women that want to help out other people can do these things. And uh, uh, you can you can make money off of it and people will pay. Um, in my, my experience, people will pay money to improve their health because right now they're paying a lot of money and they're falling apart. And, uh, you know, we got to change the insurance model uh, where people pay for insurance that just breeds disease. And I'd love to see... Uh, a disruptive model when it comes to health insurance that rewards the insureds for uh, uh, improving their lifestyle. And you get uh, penalized here in California if you don't have life insurance. Hmm. If you don't have like medical insurance, mm, right? health insurance, yeah. yeah, health insurance rather, yeah. Yep, just paid. <laughs> so get taxed uh, on that, like, and it's pretty hef- hefty. So there's all sorts of innovative models and ways of uh, uh, of doing it, but yeah, we need. To uh, the largest part of the economy is healthcare. It it dwarfs um, commerce, dwarfs the internet, dwarfs oil, dwarfs energy. The very top of the food chain is healthcare, and ninety percent or more is wasted on preventable disease, chronic disease, which is the largest problem facing humanity, and nobody talks about it. Nothing impairs the quality of lives more. Nothing reduces productivity of employees more. Nothing um, costs us more money. And nothing kills more people than chronic disease. And when was the last time you ever thought about it? Nobody's talking about it. And uh, it's going to be our demise. Our country is going to go down because we are outspending uh, money on chronic disease uh, larger than our GDP is going up. So we are medically bankrupt. We're done. Unless somebody disrupts this. Somebody like uh, maybe an Elon Musk comes in here and says, yeah, this got to go. We're going to make money off getting people better. And so making money off people getting worse. And uh, Elon, somebody uh, disruptive, uh, like that could RFK be a Jeff Bezos, maybe RFK. You know, he's a politician, but it's got to be somebody that wants to build greatness and they have to, it has to make money. 
if it doesn't make money, charity doesn't, charity is a nice thing, but charity is not going to get the job done. It's got to be something that people can get behind that rewards the innovators. Let's talk about this a little deeper for just a second before we kind of like dive into <laughs> a little bit more about visceral fat and we pull up some slides and stuff. Um, you know, most people, like there's some people and not a lot of people, there's some people that actually go to the doctor before they have something wrong with them. But even if you're somebody that cares and somebody that's trying to go to the doctor, um, the visit that you're going to have probably isn't going to really lead you to a whole lot of answers. Um, I suppose they they might, your doctor may possibly uh, advocate for some blood work. They're probably going to check, I guess, your blood pressure. I mean, what does a doctor usually do when someone goes in for a, just kind of a quote unquote routine visit, which again, no one actually really does those, but some people that do, even when you're seeking it out, you, I, I, at best, you might walk away with another appointment after you have some blood work. And then the next appointment will be about you getting on this, uh, you know, lipid lowering <laughs> yeah. uh, pharmaceutical, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you sum it up pretty nice. I think that's the experience of most people. What I would add to that is uh, the important question is, uh, how's that working out for you? How, how does that particular model, and what's so different about you that you think you're going to be any different following that model than your parents and everybody else that has done that? And what happened to them? They all got worse. They all get worse. Their bags of medicine get bigger. Their quality of life goes down. This is a broken system. And why is everybody following it? You have to be like you just did. You got to question why is that going on? And you should be going to say, um, uh, excuse me, uh, Madam Doctor, Mr. Doctor, you work for me. I'm your boss. I want you to not take take my money and profit from me. I want you to improve my life. Tell me what I got to do. But doctors aren't trained that way. Doctors are very frustrated. We're just like everybody else. We're 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 making money off the system, but you know, we get frustrated that that patients are falling apart. But I couldn't look to my my physician colleagues to improve. I was falling apart. I just kind of was like in a tide of water, like a riptide, slowly taking me out into the ocean to drown. And uh, but yeah, we need a disruptive model that says, you know, this system sets is set up to actually improve you. We're going to give you the metrics, and it's not cholesterol. I am so sick of talking about cholesterol and lipids. <laughs> All these, every doctor has it, you know, <laughs> Dr. Peter T.S., smartest out, way smarter than me. But they, they're they so, they, everybody has a different interpretation. ApoB is really bad. ApoB is not bad. All this different perspective. Let me just say, you know, who do you know that has optimized their cholesterol and all the lipids that, you know, you can study and you can find some kind of association that when you go and optimize it, that they ever get better. I personally, I'll just come out and say it, my reputation. I think it's an enormous distraction. I think I would tell RFK, uh, day one, executive order, no doctor is to talk about cholesterol again. Stop talking about it because nobody improves their lives. There's, there's just an enormous profit behind it. And what we should be talking about are things that really improve people. And really looking at those mark those metrics from a um, uh, a sensible perspective, you track them uh, until people's disease disease that they have inside their body goes away. Not they're suppressing their symptoms or profiting from them, but literally, like in my experience, um, in that that one year, and what I found since uh, I've been working out for thirteen years in trying to eradicate visceral fat, how much people improve. So. Uh, I'd immediately uh, educate people about visceral fat. And to, to kind of sum up the problem, it's no medical school in America is teaching visceral fat. It's not part of the medical curriculum. Uh, every medical school around the world follows the curriculum of uh, American, medical, American medical schools, and it's, it's not taught anywhere around the world. And uh, we would stamp out, we'd kill, we'd slay the giant chronic disease, if we just educated people about visceral fat, how, how to get rid of it, how to track it, uh, 
their disease process went away. 6,000 people, we tracked every chronic disease that they had. Every one of them either got substantially better or completely reversed, and they didn't need medicines once they got rid of their visceral fat. How many exceptions to that? None. So as far None. As far as visceral fat's concerned then, because like I think a lot of people generally focus on their body fat, how it looks visually, right? Um, what's the difference when you start focusing on visceral fat versus just focusing on lowering your general body fat percentage? Yeah, so <clears throat> that's a great question. So the other way to, to, uh, to answer that is you cannot tell visceral fat from the outside. Mm -hmm. I think our ancestors actually could. One of the ways um, I can infer it is like inflammation in the face. So if you look at that photograph um, on the on the left there, that mm. face is inflamed. The photograph on the right, uh, eleven years later, the face is less inflamed and it's it's got a certain shape. Now, what happened also during that time to my body is I lost my dad bod, where my belly was sticking out anteriorly, protruding. And my 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 abdomen got flat. And so one of the ways you can kind of infer visceral fat is how the muscles uh, are attached to the frame and the inflammation they're present in the face. So I think our ancestors were pretty good at detecting uh, change, but today uh, we we can't. So um, uh, this is this is another example of a face that uh, this is Sinead O'Connor. So she's in her 20s. She's got low amount of visceral fat. Now this is Sinead postmenopause. Uh, so she wants once if you're if ladies you're listening once you hit menopause you start accelerating the production of visceral fat it starts accumulating uh, inside of you and uh, as a result of that um, it, it shows in your face and then you also get that little dominant po pooch. Now, us males, we like to make all sorts of excuses for things, and women like to do it too with the, their abdomen pushing out, and they like to say it's it's childbirth. But there are many cases of women with incredibly flat, very attractive abdomens and attractive faces, even though they've had uh, multiple rounds of, uh, of uh, uh, births that uh, don't accumulate that. And uh, here's another individual. This guy has uh, MS. He's given me his permission to talk about it. He came to me. We did not study anybody with MS for the National Science Foundation. And he, so he called me up and said, uh, what about MS? Can you help? I said, I don't know. We never studied it. And so in nine months, look at the change in his face and look at his nose. So this is very interesting. Mm. The nose uh, appears to have significance. If you track anybody, um, looks like drops. Could, looks like he could breathe better. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he could do a lot of things better. Um, and, and but the nose I've I've noticed people that drop dead suddenly of heart attacks. You go back in their photographs, like famous people, because you can get their photographs. So I I data mine this right. Somebody who's famous, I can get their photograph uh, when they drop dead and their photograph and they're younger, and I can see these changes. So Theron lost um, a sizable amount of visceral fat during this time, and his MS symptoms are now uh, basically in remission. He has uh, significantly less. Um, uh, visceral fat and his MS symptoms have improved and their lesions on his MRI scans uh, are reversing. So the, his neurologist can't explain it, uh, but they say, just keep doing what you're doing. And since Theron's come, I've got two other patients with MS. All their symptoms are reversing as well. And uh, <clears throat> they, they, they're they losing substantial amount of visceral fat and they're going to, and here's Joe Rogan. You know, look at Joe's, when he's, uh, I think he's in his 20s here, and I don't know how old Joe is. I think he's in his 50s. Um, but look at the dramatic change um, from here to here. And it do it doesn't have, so here's a term I just literally came up with today. So this is, uh, this is not aging. You see, people think this is what you look like when you age. Why? Because that's what happens to everybody else. This is, here's my new term. It's diseasing. This is accumulation of disease, undetected, going on inside your body, visceral fat. And so Joe has no idea. But how do we how, know? How do we know this? Because like, I mean, I know like with certain patients, especially those like, obviously you see it in the face and you can see it in their body. Um, but he's relatively, I mean, as far as you can see, physically fit in the body. And yeah, the face is a little bit bigger, but how do we know that some people's faces don't just 
stay thin even though they're healthy? Like how- Reasonable question. Well, when I see a face like this and we've scanned them, two things. Um, they have visceral fat and they also have uh, a bulging, uh, or a, we'll put it more scientifically, an increased sagittal abdominal diameter. The SAD, sagittal abdominal diameter. So in the uh, sagittal plane, mm-hmm. the the width between the belly button, the umbilicus anterior surface of the abdomen, to the posterior back, uh, the, the back or the anterior surface of the vertebral body, if you really want to get scientific, has increased. And maybe, uh, Eric, we can pull up a, an a, uh, MRI and we can just show an example. Be of Andrew. The oh, Andrew is on control. Sorry. No problem. You're uh, learning new names. You're <laughs> and you're controlling the podcast. I'll, so I'll say there's, there's one right here. So let's, uh, okay, good. This is outstanding. <laughs> so the abdominal diameter. So in this image right down here, this is the vertebral body. The distance from here, which is the belly button. See that air, guys? And this is the vertebral body. Now, this this happens to be Sean Kelly, Sean Michael Kelly from uh, Digital Social Out. He's the first podcast in the history of humanity, went out and got an MRI scan. So shout out to Sean. Uh, all that white stuff in there, that is visceral fat. That white stuff, and he's only 27. So, but if you can see the bulge going on, this, this Sean is laying down. Um, what you want is a flat abdomen. So this is my scan. So this is me. This is one of my first scans. And uh, my, my abdomen is flat. And Sean's is bulging out because of that visceral fat displacement. So, in the case of Joe Rogan, Joe's got uh, anterior displacement of his uh, sagittal plane. His measurement is thicker than when when he was uh, photographed on the left. And I would bet the family farm <laughs> that Joe is ro- loaded with visceral fat inside, much worse than Sean Michael Kelly. So these are the muscles. Um, my muscles are quite big. He's these that I have, and and Sean's muscles are smaller on the side. And uh, look at the erecte spinae muscles. See these um, muscles in your back when you lay down on a go into an MRI scanner. Do you see the white now infiltrating? That's that's infiltrating fat, it's human marbling in this twenty-seven year old's back. And so this is why you end up when you're older. You have a crooked back and you're bent over and you because the muscles start getting replaced with inflammatory fat. And you see my muscles are nice and I'm in my 50s. So I'm almost double double his age. But having gotten rid of my visceral fat, you get rid of uh, the myosteatosis fat um, and the muscles, they perform better. And the other interesting thing is, you see this very important, guys, just see this black line in here? And this is Sean. This is Sean Michael right? Kelly. Mm-hmm. These are the love handles, okay? By way of orientation, he's laying on his back. That's his belly button, point to the top of the ceiling. These are his back muscles. And then these are love handles. So if Sean's walking down the beach, you could see he's got he's got a collection of tissue and everybody knows love handles. But this, this is Sean's by MRI. Now, that black line in there, that's called scarpa's fascia. It's a membrane that separates these two compartments. Here's what your doctor doesn't know, has never told you. That one compartment here is called deep sub-Q fat, deep subcutaneous fat. This one right here, superficial subcutaneous fat. All right, you ready to get disrupted, everybody? Your bodybuilders looking so shredded, you're losing your superficial subcutaneous fat. Now, I want you to write this word down, adiponectin. This is why you listen to Mark. Adiponectin, A-D-I-P-O-N-E-C-T-I-N. That's a word that Big Pharma doesn't want you to know about. That word you get excited about and you research is going to eradicate disease in your body, just like visceral fat. So visceral fat is bad, adiponectin is good. So I call it the four horsemen, the the black-hatted horsemen that have black hats. They're uh, uh, one of them. Uh, is visceral fat. The second one is human marbling, uh, visceral uh, uh, fat infiltrating the muscles. The third one is deep subcutaneous fat. 
Why are they all bad? Because they have guns that shoot inflammatory molecules. And it's not the horsemen, it's their guns. Constantly shooting these little tiny micro bullets all day long uh, that gradually wear your body out and it's called diseasing. That's why Joe Rogan's face is so inflamed and Joe's not the man he used to be when he's in, in his 20s and you accumulate medical problems because of all that inflammation going on. So that deep subcutaneous fat is super bad and this one, super good because superficial subcutaneous fat, adiponectin, that's where it comes from. And so if you're shredding your body and you're walking around and you got a six pack, you don't have this protective layer. I don't have it here. <laughs> I have very little superficial subcutaneous fat. So here's what I say. If you really want to be optimally healthy, you want to have a big ass six pack. You want to have them. You just don't want to see them except on an MRI. You want a thin layer of this, this superficial fat covering it up. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not like you're going to die uh, if you don't have the superficial subcutaneous fat, but you lose the benefit it provides through adiponectin, which reduces mortality from heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, cancer, and even obesity. Is this similar to brown fat? Um, it's, it's similar in regard to the fact that it's healthy. Brown fat is brown and it's healthy because of increased mitochondria that has. This doesn't have an increased mitochondria, but it has adiponectin. Brown fat has a tiny bit of adiponectin, but this powerhouse. So this is why women live longer than us guys. Women don't have heart attacks in their 20s and 30s. I'm an ER doctor. I've had uh, patients come in in their 20s, males having heart attacks. I've lost patients in their 30s from heart attacks. Um, I don't have females having heart attacks in their 40s, 20s, 30s, and 40s because uh, they don't have as much visceral fat and they uh, also have more adiponectin. So women have more sub fat and it protects them. Us fellas, we're working to get rid of our uh, subcutaneous fat. A lot of bodybuilders are. And uh, that's really fun. All right. So there's, yeah, Joe Rogan. So here, here's what, what I would say. Joe's, um, now depending, he's pretty inflamed here, but uh, back then, you if you did an uh, MRI scan and you measured his abdominal diameter, uh, he, he will have more abdominal diameter uh, when he was younger with less visceral fat than when he's, he's older. So, But I mean, um, compared to a 52-year-old, that's pretty damn good, I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. He's better than most. I and mean, he's going to have more muscle, but it's not... Um, it's not just muscle. You got to look at yeah. the ratio, what's going on in that muscle. So here's what, what we, we'd see. Is there a, More a couple, marbleization here and less there. Is there a couple of potential things going on? You know, uh, Joe Rogan aside, but I'll just kind of speak for myself. You know, I've utilized performance enhancing drugs and um, I've, uh, you know, now I'm on like a TRT dosage or whatever. <clears throat> and testosterone uh, clearly changes uh, people's facial structure, mm -hmm. um, and it, and it might be doing some of these damaging things uh, to the body as well. I, I'm not really aware. Um, have you uh, you know been able to kind of study any of that, or have you? Yeah, not? it's a great question. Because mm -hmm. yeah, like I'm someone's face like changes drastically. Mm -hmm. Guys test when they face. Take, <laughs> yeah, so sometimes it just mm. sometimes it will just flat out get bloated, right? Sometimes it'll get big, mm -hmm. but someone's like facial features over time changes. As well, I Christian mean, Christian Guzman is an example. Obviously, faces uh. change. Period. As you get a little older, there's like so many different reasons why it might happen. But when somebody uses uh, steroids, in particular, when men use steroids, something kind of happens, like the nose and some yeah. of the structure. At least it looks that way. No, it's super it's, obvious it's, in women, right? Like that's yeah, the that, very that, obvious. There you go. That's even better point. Yeah. So one of my client clients that came to me was a very wealthy guy owned a lot of companies and he was filled with visceral fat inside. And as it turns out, he took a lot of TRT. He was taking testosterone and he had a very inflamed face. Mm. This is a very interesting, weird story. This guy comes into my practice and if you haven't figured out already, Sean O'Meara loves talking this stuff. This is my passion, right? This is my, my jam. This guy walks into my practice He's he's got this face. It's just like Mark was talking about. It's kind of flamed. He's got this Bring big up nose. Some good, uh, old faces of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so are like world record fat faces. I like. don't have this client's face. Or I don't have his permission to to show his face. But boy, when he walked in, um, I. I, I could I couldn't talk about it. I couldn't talk to him. I was stuttering. 
<laughs> and I'm like, God, why am I stuttering? So I'm having this like private conversation. I'm very analytical. I'll just come out and say, I've got a touch of Asperger's, probably more than a touch, my wife would say. And so I analyze a lot of stuff. And so I'm analyzing why I'm so scared, you know, talking to this guy, I'm stuttering. And I realized I'm afraid that this guy could literally drop in front of me and have a heart attack. Mm. He looked that disease. Could see his blood pressure. So he, uh, he's just happy and, and having a great time. And I show him good scans and bad scans, what, what a, a good scan looks like, very little visceral fat, what a bad scan looks like. And when I open up his scan, this guy's standing up, just kind of like a stand-up desk, just like this. And I show him his scan. He goes, he turns uh, green, Mm. Like a brand new second lieutenant from the officers, uh, who just got an officer's course and smoking their first cigar, the men's the officer's mess. Then he three seconds later, he's turned gray. And now I'm like captivated. I'm looking at this dude's face. I'm like, I can't even talk about his MRI scan because this guy's a human chameleon. And then he turned ischemic white, the 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 color of somebody who's either slipped right into VTAC in front of me. Uh, or an exsanguinating gunshot wound where they're going to die. And so, yeah, face he had a face a little bit like that dude there <laughs> uh, on the left. And so Handsome. he he literally, when he, he literally turned that pale white, he he just passed out. I hear that picture breathing. <laughs> <laughs> just kind of snoring a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Snor snorting so, and breathing. Yeah, so face is... You know, I look, I go by Mall America. I live in Minneapolis. I walk through the Mall America and I'm doing micro calculations, instantaneous calculations of people uh, based on my experience, how much visceral fat they have in their faces and their body. So to the question on testosterone, yeah, people tend to have, um, they take it, they have, uh, um, you know, higher levels of uh, inflama inflammatory changes consistent with higher levels of visceral fat and deep subcutaneous uh uh, fat and uh, fat in their muscles. So I get my clients who who are on um, T to get off of it. Really? Yep. I okay. get them off of it, and um, I get them using their testicles. Nothing works as good as your your testicles getting back doing like what we were talking outside stress hermetic ex exercises, maximum intensity exercises, sunshine, uh, cold plunge. I know <clears throat> Lane Norton says in the, you know. No value in doing a cold plunge, but um, I, I, what I'm different about, you know, lots of lots of doctors out there, are carnivore doctors, lots of vegans. You come into my practice, um, you know, they're just telling you eat plants, eat meat. I drop forty eight things on you. Drop forty eight things. You got to do these things. You got to live your life, change it up, and do do as many of these things as you can. And when it doesn't work. I used to give these things in the National Science Foundation back then. It was about, uh, it was seven and then went to 20 and then, you know, 25. It, you know, we used to give it to people without scanning them. You know what they do with it? Nothing. Mm. But when you scan somebody and you show them they've got a problem inside, then you can, you can, you can get their attention and they'll turn it around. So, you know, T, um, if you, if somebody's taking testosterone, um, they, they just, you got to show them what's going on inside, why they, they need it because they're filled with visceral fat and uh, uh, how you can you can change that around. One of my earliest clients, a guy came to me, 457 pounds, came to an urgent care because why? I worked in this urgent care part-time to make money because I volunteered for the National Science Foundation study full-time. Every day, 4 a.m. to 7 p.m., I would volunteer my life for our country to eliminate chronic disease. Why? Because I wanted every man and woman to be able to benefit what happened to me. My life churned around that much as a human when I got rid of, you know, chronic disease in my body. And I'm like, I'm going to study this. So we, CJ and I, <laughs> we did volunteer for seven years and uh, we took jobs working in urgent cares. So this 450 pound guy came in. Um, I thought I was going to get fired over this guy. And he said, uh, he, he was get, getting a physical exam for testosterone. He had some like medical practice in California. They need to have physical exam in Minnesota. And he goes, you could, I can hear visceral fat in people's voices too. Hmm. It, it, it starts invading their muscle and their voices. So he had a voice like this. He goes, uh, he goes, I get the impression you think this is a bad, bad idea. 
And I said, yeah, I think it is. He goes, well, you got a better idea? I said, yeah, come in, see me when this practice closes four o'clock and I'll tell you about it. So he came back four o'clock, spent an hour and a half with me and uh, it was all dark. And uh, my wife kept calling me and my phone was blowing up for my wife because she's like, why is he so late? And uh, and uh, I finally said to this guy, his name was Bill. I said, Bill, can I just take this call and tell my wife, you know, I'll, I'll you know, Real quick, and, he, and so I answered the phone. I said, "Yeah, honey, I'm sorry, I'm late. Uh, I'll, uh, I'm just doing some work here, finish up a lot of work, and then uh, as soon as I, I'll, I'll give you a ride. As soon as I, I'm on the road, um, I'll give you a call." And uh, he heard me basically lie to my my wife, and he said, "Because this doctor lied, and he's doing all this for me for free, I'm going to listen to him, and I'm going to do what he's telling me." And he did. And that guy. Lost 450, 450 pounds. He had a 56-inch waist. Today, Bill has a 34-inch waist, never gained his weight back. There we go. And because he believed that physician, he believed what I was telling him. He saw me be <laughs> lying to my wife. And so, you know, if you're on, you're on testosterone, you need to have a reason. You got to believe that you can change your life. And we do a terrible job, I think. Mark, we do a terrible job, us physicians, to give people hope that they they could have any kind of a better life other than just taking medications. If you're someone that's taking supplements or vitamins or anything to help move the needle in terms of your health, how do you know you really need them? And the reason why I'm asking you how do you know is because many people don't know their levels of their testosterone, their vitamin D, all these other labs like their thyroid, and they're taking these supplements to help them function at peak performance. But that's why we've partnered with Merrick Health for such a long time now, because you can get yourself different lab panels like the Power Project panel, which is a comprehensive set of labs to help you figure out what your different levels are. And when you do figure out what your levels are, you'll be able to work with a patient care coordinator that will give you suggestions as far as nutrition optimization, supplementation, or if you're someone who's a candidate and it's necessary, hormonal optimization to help move you in the right direction so you're not playing guesswork with your body. Also, if you've already gotten your lab work done, but you just want to get a checkup, we also have a checkup panel that's made so that you can check up and make sure that everything is moving in the right direction if you've already gotten comprehensive lab work done. This is something super important that I've done for myself. I've had my mom work with Merrick. We've all worked with Merrick just to make sure that we're all moving in the right direction and we're not playing guesswork with our body. Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, that's over at MerrickHealth.com slash PowerProject. And at checkout, enter promo code PowerProject to save 10% off any one of these panels or any lab on the entire website. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Yeah, I think uh, Gary Brecka, he told Dana White when he was going to die. And that really kind of opened up Dana White's eyes. You know, Dana White's been, I'm sure he's been told many times, he's been to many different doctors, but once he had somebody that said, hey, look, you know, here's what's compromised and here's how long that lasts for, he probably have about another 10 years. And he was like, oh, fuck, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I should at least try what Gary Brecka is suggesting to me. And that's when he, I think he took 12 or 16 weeks. And I think he was maybe even just halfway through that. Uh, he was already having such good results. So it doesn't take a long time for a lot of people to start to feel a little bit better. Yeah. And then Dana White got to the point where he was calling Gary Brecka. He's like, dude, you don't understand. I feel amazing. He's like, no. <laughs> He's like, you don't even feel amazing yet. He's like, you just feel normal. This is the way you should feel. Yeah. That's a th uh, shout out to Gary. Good job, Gary. Because that's uh, that's mirrors what I have uh, seen with clients that come to me. They just start feeling normal. And they, you know, and I, I do the same thing. Uh, they they start saying all these great things, you know, within the first month or two working with me. And I go, pff, pff, nothing. <laughs> Wait till you see what happens once you start living your life correctly. You get rid of that disease. This is what's going to happen to you. You're going to start improving. Right now, you're circling the drain. <laughs> you're going down the crapper. But once you get rid of that visceral fat and you start improving, then your life, your quality of life is going to, to explode to a new level like it used to. Here's the best example. You guys lift weights, go into a gym. You know who you do not see a lot in gym? Older guys and older women. Why? Because they don't improve. Why go to a gym if you're not going to improve? And what we found is the ability 
to hyper, you know, induce muscle protein synthesis hypertrophy wanes in proportion to visceral fat. And once you get rid of visceral fat, then you can start improving again like you were when you were 16, 18 years old. So the fountain of youth really is getting rid of this visceral fat, fat in your muscle. And you'll you'll attack the problem that probably many guys that come to you that are a little bit older and they're frustrated with the gains they're going to get. But it's not just muscle, muscle protein synthesis. It's everything in their life, everything you're meant to improve. We had a culture for hundreds of thousands of years. We hunted. We 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 uh, we basically our lifestyle was predicated on how well we could hunt, and uh, we've gotten away from that. And so I like to tell people like Dana, white dude, you made a lot of money. Most people, you know, that make a lot of money lose their health along the way. And what good does it do if you have all this money? And then you've you've lost your health. You can't even enjoy it. So uh, one day I'd like to go around and lecture to young people and say you got to learn how to optimize your wealth. And that doesn't mean like getting a lot of money. It means you get a hunt. And I don't mean go out and like hunt deer or something. I mean you have got to be able to do whatever you do as a hunter and with some other form of living, and you got to do it well. You've got to be successful, men and women must be successful in the workplace. They got to be high performers. They got to be productive. And maybe it is what you do for a living, like Chris Haynes, you know, he's a hunter. But uh, you, you got to be successful. And then all along, you not only have to optimize your ability to hunt and make that money, you got to optimize your ability to optimize your health. You got to, so when you are in your 50s and 60s, your whole life, You've optimized your well, you've optimized your health, and then this is what a fully actualized human being does. They influence other people. They say, look at my life. It's well lived. I'm an effective hunter and I'm healthy. And that's what you want to do. Who is doing that today? We're not teaching it. And that's what we should be doing. You got to hunt well. You got to preserve your health. And it's critically important. The loudest applause I ever got was to a group of 20-some-year-old guys from Texas A&M called One Army. Shout out to that group. I talked about those two points. And normally, I just talk about health. I just go down and say how to optimize your health. But so many of my clients came to me and said, go down there and tell these guys they got to optimize their health so that they don't end up like us, falling, losing our health all along the way. And and I realized a lot of these guys, even if I get them healthy, if they can't hunt, Mark, they are stressed out because they cannot bring home the money. They're losers in the workplace. They are filled with cortisol. And they can be as healthy as you, you know, uh, as can be. But if they're stressed out that way, it's it's it, they're going to be filled with disease inside of them. And so you got to be able to hunt well. So optimize your health, optimize your wealth. You got to do it together. We need to be teaching this in schools. What's some of the protocol look like? You did mention, you know, cutting out carbohydrates. Maybe you can give us like 10 main yeah. points. <laughs> so yeah, on my Instagram, I actually put them on the top of my page, like what you got to do. So, you know, right away, I recommend cutting out. What's process, your Instagram handle, by the way? Um, just D R S E A N. O M A R A uh, is uh, my my handle, and uh, uh, one thing we should probably um, pull up, Andy, is there a, a yellow and red like six squares, yellow and red? You see these uh, series of uh, yellow red squares, kind of like uh, on the uh, the images you sent me, or on Instagram? Yeah, okay. it should be on the images I, I sent you. Yeah, uh, uh, yellow and red, like six squares. Um, there. Whoop. Um, nope, a little bit more. Um, hmm. the, nope. <laughs> oh, yeah, right there. Let's pull that one up. Okay, so here they are. So this is a, a guy, 68 years old. See all that visceral fat inside? We painted it red. Mm. And he's got marbleization in his muscle. And look, in two weeks, you guys never been in medical school you're not radiologists, and you just diagnosed. He reduced his visceral fat in two weeks. 
what this guy do? He cut out processed foods, cut out carbs. So he eliminated carbs. He uh, dramatically improved his visceral fat in just that two weeks. But by time, 35 weeks has transpired. And this is the only time this has been done in the world in the history of humanity. This guy just cut carbs. He didn't do anything else. He did not exercise one minute. So look at that. Visceral fat being eliminated without exercise. Um, all he did was dietary adjustments and macronutrients, and he had that substantial reduction in his uh, in his visceral fat. He so didn't improve sleep oh, or anything like that. Like no other confounders. No, you know, didn't change his sleep. Didn't start. You know, going out to uh, you know, a, you know, did no exercise. Didn't start getting sunshine. Uh, the only only thing he did, and he was curmudgeon. Like we tried to get him to the other things. And he was a wealthy guy. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And I, I thank God, you know, things happened for a reason. Um, I wanted to fire him, but we didn't have any older people. He's 68. So I'm like, all right, what the hell? You know, we'll just let you cut out carbs and we'll, this would be a dumb study. <laughs> did, he eat a, did he eat a lot of uh, dietary fat? Because some uh, people might have questions about that. Uh, he he had a he was eating a, a just a standard American diet at, at the time, and all he did was he he ate clean. So he went to like uh, meats and vegetables, and he cut out uh, especially pro, uh, cut, but so he was eating fatty meat. Um, and, uh, but the big, the big change was just uh, eliminating, uh, carbs, especially processed foods, no other exercise. And, and so I, I, I think this, this scan should be in every medical school, should be taught in every elementary school. And, uh, you know, if you think about, um, uh, changing your diet, let's say you want to cut out carbs or you want to add them back in, you want to start on fruit and honey, you want to go vegan, get a scan, see what's going on inside and then reevaluate yourself um, at two, three, four, five, you know, months down the road, and see if you're heading in the right direction. Because that's that's what happened. To this guy, maybe that's not what's going to happen to you. So maybe maybe actually, you know, the carbohydrates could be um, tolerated. You know, who people who who are people that I've seen that can tolerate carbohydrates? People that have a microbiome that allow them to metabolize carbohydrates better. Nobody talks about that. The microbiome is this big black box. And so in the future, we see um, people doing fecal microbiota transplants and suddenly their diet, they're, they're losing weight, eating the same diet. Um, they, could, they could return to a diet that formerly caused them to lose weight. And now this FMT, fecal microbiota transplant, is permitting to change. Now, that's not, to your question, like what what are the protocols and stuff? We don't we don't recommend. In fact, in America, the FDA restricts physicians from doing uh, fecal microbiota transplants, except for one indication, C. difficile. But I will look in your eye, both of you. The future is going to be FMTs, and I'll take you. It won't even be so far in the future. You guys are doing FMTs right here. You guys are awesome. You're healthy. Just by lifting weights and touching those barbells, you're transferring your fecal microbes to each other. You may not yes. want to do that. <laughs> Especially him. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, birds of feather flock together. That's why you hang with winners. You're attracted to winners. Uh, because nature, through imprinting, wants you to hang with high performers. And when you play basketball, you high-five each other, you chest bump. When somebody I'm just thinking of Carl Lenore's suggestion. Mm -hmm. Eating ass. Yeah. Well, for, <laughs> Carl Lenore? Yeah, he said, uh, He said, you know, fi find a woman that's real healthy and eat their ass. <laughs> oh, you know. That's why I love you, Sam. <laughs> Carl is awesome. I He's started ahead listening of his, to you. Yeah. You, you know, know, 30 uh, years ahead of his time. You know, it's part, you know, um, attraction, sexuality is um, part of the drive in human nature to contribute to the species. And so when you think about sexual activity, uh, the attraction is to um, somebody that's very healthy. That's why we were not attracted to a woman that is uh, very diseased. But those microbes really uh, do play a huge role. And uh, kissing, uh, you know, intercourse, 
uh, just cuddling. We're swapping microbes. So shout out to Carl. That's pretty insightful stuff, Carl. I'll, I'll have to talk to you more about that. <laughs> and uh, like uh, in terms of like, uh, I've heard you talk about microbes and fermented foods. And I think that you're like fermenting your own foods, but can we just, you know, out of convenience, can we buy like kimchi from the store? Or do we need to have like our next door neighbor make, bury it in their backyard for us? Or something? <laughs> yeah, Mark, that's great. So, yeah, I used to make my own uh, fermented foods, but then, you know, you get busy and uh, I just don't have time to do it. And now I realize that there are so many uh, different um, artisans out. Like when you travel, I tell my clients, when you go anywhere in the country, you should Google food co-op near me. Co-op is a cooperative. But you can just write the word coop, C-O-O-P, food co-op near me. You'll find all these fermented foods being sold in local food Mm co-ops. Why is that important? Because the microbes in that local area are going to um, give you uh, an addition. It's Noah's Ark. So I tell my clients, you want to build Noah's Ark inside your microbiome. So we were nomads. We would travel. We'd follow herds of uh, bison and animals. And every watering hole and every new location would uh, add new microbes to us that would make us high performers. And uh, we would collect them and they're with you for the rest of your life if you take care of them. Don't drink chlorinated water. That's not how you take care of them. Chemicals, food preservatives, even antibiotics, they they disrupt our microbiome. Now, I'm not advocating as an MD, never take antibiotics, discuss that with your doctor but it'll probably be a short conversation. They won't know much about the microbiome, but that's not what you want to do. You don't want to rely on antibiotics. You want to avoid ever having that kind of problem. And healthy people that are contributing and building a microbiome, like you guys are uh, through, you know, camaraderie. And uh, if you eat these fermented foods, you're, you're contributing to it. So Noah's Ark, two of every species, you do not eat, you do not need a lot of these things. So I sum up my eating strategies. Um, Sean O'Mara is meat and microbes. I eat healthy meat. And then I eat a variety of microbes. Not a lot because how much, um, how, how much quantity does it take for, for you to get flu? Not much. So you just need a little bit of these microbes, a little bit of fermented food. When you, when you eat your meat, chew them together. Get a variety of these things, you know, improve your digestion, improve the collection of microbes inside of you. And our future report cards are not going to be visceral fat. They're going to be sequencing uh, of our microbiome. Because literally, I can tell how really much of a biological badass you are by the microbes that you've accumulated in your lifetime. Because they tell the story of a life well-lived or a life poorly lived based on those species. And we're still learning those ways, but it's, you guys, you guys have a very good idea how to live good lives just by your appearance and your performance. But most Americans have no idea about this. They're couch potatoes, they're eating ice cream, tasty foods, they're pursuing pleasure instead of pursuing what makes them better. And as a result, they lose their, lose their lives, their quality of life all along. So it really gets back to that microbiome. And that's why I say meat and microbes. Don't eat these fermented foods like a side, like you'd eat a uh, French fries on the side. It's just a teeny garnish, a little bit of these fermented foods with your, your meat. And then when it comes to meat, dude, you need to hunt like your ancestors. They knew which bison was the healthiest, which animal in that particular herd was the healthiest. And that's the one they went to. All the other predators in the world, uh, lions and tigers, they hunt the easiest, the young, the old, the infirm. Humans, we learned when we hunted the very best species in that herd, that it gave us better quality meat and better quality animal skins. And in those animal skins, are the microbes. You want to get awesome? Go hunt. Get the the microbes. Chris Haynes is awesome because he's getting... Chris the, Cam. Uh, um, well, they're both are probably... <laughs> they're, they're both? both? Oh, okay. Yeah, they both, they both hunt. So they, you know, they... And he's not, 
you know, he's not hunting like lame, gross animals. So when he's, he's gaining, that's why that guy is just a high performer and he wants to be the greatest predator in the world. But when he's getting these healthy microbes, he's having conferred on his body their microbes. Mm. So we learned our ancestors 100,000 years ago, if you took an animal skin that was like a, from a, a lame ass animal and you put it on uh, another human, they turned into a lame ass human. But if you take uh, a really highly, you know, the best animal in that herd, you skin that animal and you put that skin on you, then you go into a whole new level. You get those microbes that literally makes you better. So I tell that story because that's how you need to live your life. You got to get, Big Pharma doesn't want you to find out about the microbiome, doesn't want you to understand that. Adiponectin, these things you got to learn about so that you can figure out ways to optimize your microbiome, hang with winners, it's a big one, and stop harming, cut out chlorinated water, food preservatives, uh, and processed foods, horrifically destructive to our microbiome, and uh, travel and do, you know, badass things. Go out in the world, experience these microbes, and they'll take you to a new level. Have you noticed any differences from seafood versus, uh, you know, omega-3s versus saturated fats and things like that? Yeah. Yeah, actually, a uh, really good question. So, higher levels of omega-3 and, all, you know, uh, just like if you eat uh, an animal game meat and uh, uh, animals that are really grass-fed, grass-finished. So, one weird thing, you know, that that uh, I see happening to me and now it's happening to my clients uh, is we you start peeing green. And oh, yeah, that's never happened to me. What? <laughs> Peeing green. Uh -huh. So your urine turns yellow green first, and then eventually it's green yellow. Why? A little chlorophyll in there. Well, it's 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 the flavanols. So when you optimize your microbiome, your epithelial cells in your your gastrointestinal tract become so healthy that you can absorb a lot more of those flavanols, polyphenols, and vitamins and those molecules than you ever could before. And so what I have noticed, I'll just tell you, when I go off a of grass-fed and I eat green-fed, it goes back yellow. When I go back to really healthy bison, venison, it goes green. How Do many times? Green all 50 times I've tested it. I at don't least. know. No, <laughs> so, I'm not sure. I don't. I, yeah, I, don't, I it's, haven't really. It's you, 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 you wow. pay attention to it. And I do mainly eat grass fed, and so that happens. And uh, it, it's it just it, and so the same thing with uh, seafood. If I really good fresh wild caught seafood, uh, I'll my, I'll maintain that. But if you know if you do some farmed or something, it will go back to yellow. So uh, absolutely eat wild wild game meat, wild caught seafood. And uh, the healthier you are, the, the more these uh, interesting things. And the other thing that happens is uh, bowel movements. You have, I have a bowel movement and you sit on the toilet for a half hour. I have a bowel movement in about three to five seconds. Perfectly tapered and points. Well <laughs> <laughs> and you do not want to have it fast. You, you, your bowel movement should be like a reflex. And so it should be pointy because when you, when you have a bowel movement, this is your rectum. This is your anus. That Carl was just talking about. <laughs> um, so on the outside, it looks like this, and then unfolds in a healthy person. And there's a little tiny hole, and then a, a pointy tip, and the stool comes out perfectly smooth, and it closes pointy tip. And so if you're not having those pointy tips on your stool, you're not ha you're not functionally, uh, you don't have a, a good, healthy, functional gut yet. A and tapered it, shit, like you should yeah. barely need to wipe. Yeah. Wipe and then, just in case. And, the, and then if you, do you have kids, Mark? I do, yeah. Do you, do you remember toilet training them? He said, now daddy says to wipe and you wipe their 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 bottom and there'd be no, there'd be nothing on yeah. the toilet paper. Mm -hmm. So that's the other weird thing that starts happening to my clients. Um, no stool when they wipe because that anus starts f functioning so much better. So you have that to look forward to. You start watching that. <laughs> so all these changes that I never, they never taught us in medical school. This is just happening and you could, now I ask people all sorts of questions, but I'm like, you know, all these very interesting observations start happening when we gave people, you know, so many strategies and they became so optimally healthy that these interesting things start improving. And the other one uh, we talked about is erectile, you know, function, get rid of your, 
your visceral fat and your erection if you're a male and it hasn't been studying the females because I've stayed away from <laughs> this one so I must have trouble. <laughs> but, you know, your erectile function improves and then the, f- the, the, the fully optimized sign of a male erection is not a really hard erection, but one that bounces. Okay, not just a little it's bounce. It's the doing, doing, doing that, right? yeah. <laughs> But you really want a very pronounced bounce like with, every, every, <laughs> <laughs> with every heartbeat. So uh, the healthy you are, uh, so when you were 15, 16, 17 years old, you had this bounce interaction. Now, uh, if you're in your 20s, 30s, it's, it's slowly going away. And by the time you're in your 40s and 50s <clears throat> and 60s, it's gone. So we get our clients back to healthy erections and then the boner bounce. And it starts out a little tiny bounce and it gets more and more pronounced. Any images over there? Uh, <laughs> no, there that's Here, another show. Here's a client <laughs> from a couple years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Any volunteers? <laughs> But uh, yeah, I think uh, that is, is, again, it goes back to sexuality is part of health and the healthy you are, um, more, uh, the more nature wants you to contribute to the gene pool. And uh, we've had clients, I had one client <clears throat> that came to me, uh, 64 years old, infertile his whole life, married to his wife for 24 years, uh, no children, got rid of his uh, visceral fat and... Uh, called me up and he said, you're not going to believe it, doc. Uh, got my wife pregnant at the age of 64. Whoa. So fertility. So what do we see? How with, old was uh, she? Uh, she was 11 years younger. So I think she was 50, wow. uh, 53. Yeah, right at the end. But it happened. Nice. And uh, so, yeah, it was a good thing. And he said, but I, he says, I just wish it happened a long time he said, because I'm not getting any sleep, you know, with this new baby. <laughs> but uh, it, it, if you know anybody struggling with fertility, uh, have them investigate, find out about visceral fat, get an MRI scan, get rid of it. Um, because what we see in males are uh, semen counts go up, semen uh, sperm swim way faster, and they swim straighter. How do you test that? Um, so there's a cool device. <laughs> there is a cool device called Yo Fertility, Y O. And you can do a at home test. And uh, it's got this cool little thing, and um, you um, it will increase. Um, can you can you actually like, visualize it. Creates a can video. Can you put film. it on the TV screen? Like watch it. <laughs> yeah, I, like an event. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah. You, like, you I think literally. That guy's gonna win. He's yeah. gonna win. Oh no, he lost. <laughs> you can place bets on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, fertility goes to uh, how awesome you are. So you want to have a super high sperm count. You want to have fast swimmers uh, that swim really straight. Uh, clients that have infertility, their, their sperm is swimming around in circles. We give them the test and uh, they don't have as many counts and they swim really slow and weak. And then we show them, it's a, it's a cool visual. I'm telling you, the more you see this and not a number, that's why I don't like the DEXA scan. Hmm. You can really get people to uh, to improve. So they like seeing their sperm count go, go up and uh, there's some visuals. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so... Um, yeah, this is, uh, you know, f- fertility is a uh, very interesting overlap between uh, health, reproduction, sexuality. There's no shame in wanting to have great sex. And there's no shame for wanting your member to perform the way it should be. A lot of us sometimes have some issue with blood flow, but that's where Joy Mode comes in. Let me read you these ingredients because it's not going to be very long. Vitamin C, L-citrulline, arginine nitrate, and panic skin sing. The cool thing about the ingredients in this is that they're all natural and that they're going to help you increase your blood flow, not just everywhere. So you could use this as a pre-workout. You will increase blood flow when it counts to where you need it. So if you know you're going to have a good time a little bit later, 60 minutes beforehand, put some joy mode in some water, drink it. And then when it comes time to perform, and you know what I mean by perform, you're going to be ready because you're going to be flowing. Joy mode's going to help you do that. Andrew, how can they get it? <laughs> yes, that's over at usejoymode.com slash power project. And at checkout, enter promo code power project to save 20% off your entire order. Again, usejoymode.com slash power project, promo code power project, links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. The DEXA scan does give us some information, all right? It does. And uh, we really should talk about it. So DEXA does, um, does give very accurate information, I would say, relative to... Uh, to an MRI scan or CT scan. It's not going to be as accurate, but 
um, it gets the job done when it, when it comes to quantification. Where it pales is, as you said out uh, earlier, Mark, it doesn't allow you to visualize. So you just get a number. And, and so it's a little bit like uh, if I give you a crypto wallet you know, with uh, eight digits in it and give you, uh, gave it to you, um, that, that might bring a little warm smile on you. But what if I, I, I gave you uh, 10 homes that were valued at $300 million uh, a piece and uh, I gave you 20 Ferraris and Maseratis. Uh, I gave you five uh, Fed ship yachts. Uh, put put all that in front of you, you're going to have a way bigger smile. So it's how you visualize your metrics. It's If you just are tracking numbers, it's just not going to be as meaningful. So you want to see that disease, particularly disease process, um, inside of your muscles in a marbleization that's going to piss you off. You see visceral fat uh, in your abdomen. You see chunks of fat around your heart. Maybe we could, uh, this one image, I think I can pull it up uh, here to see if this- What uh, would be a, is there some decent numbers oh, you can give people? This is the guy who passed out, by the way. <laughs> is there some decent uh, decent numbers you can give people? Um, because I'm imagining most people don't have like an MRI scan. Is there some sort of numbers or percentages you could give people that have had DEXA scans? Like, hey, you should have under, you know, 10, you know, 10 pounds, or I, yeah. I don't know what the numbers would be. Yeah, great question. And uh, people, people want to know that. The, the answer is you want none. This stuff is uh, highly inflammatory, disease-causing. Uh, the lower you get it, the better you feel, the better you look, the better you live. So don't, um, don't settle for this highly inflammatory stuff. It's, it's, uh, you want it eradicated out of your body through um, you know, good living, and uh, that's incredibly important to, to do that. So you do not want to have um, that, uh, that disease process, uh, within you. I'm looking for, uh, oh, actually maybe I'll pull up, uh, this, this scan here. So we talked about blood flow. These are brain arteries. So you see here, this is the middle cerebral artery and it gets really weak here. What we notice is people got rid of visceral fat, um, that, uh, blocked arteries. Here's uh, a big blockage. You can see in that particular image there, I circle in white. Nine months later, the artery improved on the right side and on the left side, um, it completely opened up in nine months from getting rid of uh, visceral fat. So this guy uh, significantly improved his, his blood flow. Um, and the other interesting thing is, uh, um, it won't be able to show up there, but you see my brachial artery, I have visible pulses <clears throat> throughout my whole body now. So as we open up these arteries, Clients uh, no longer have to feel their pulse. They can just watch their pulses all over their body. And uh, after the podcast, I want to do here, I'll lay down. You'll see my belly shoots up from the blood gushing down my aorta. So you, if you think it's because I don't have much sub-Q fat, well, I got a lot of guts over between my, my aorta you know, uh, and uh, my skin, and it pushes, surges up my abdomen. Now, if somebody came in, age 61, which was my age today, and their belly was shooting up like that, I would get a CT scan or an ultrasound because I'd be terrified that they have what's called an abdominal aortic aneurysm, like a big swelling of their aorta, which is about to rupture. But the truth is you want to have visible pulses. You know, the, the CPR algorithm, check for a pulse, you know, feel for a pulse. You should see a pulse. You know, healthy humans, you should visualize uh, a pulse and, and uh, significant optimization of blood flow. And that's what we see, you know, in these arteries opening up when you get rid of visceral fat. And when I go do these lectures to like doctors and hospitals, they all have the same look on their face in the audience. They're like this. Because they just have never seen any anything like this. They just, it's not part of our training that you can open up arteries. The only way you open up arteries is stenting. You know, you put coils in and and stent them. So the idea that you change how you're living your life, how you eat, how you exercise, get sunshine, de-stress, you sprint, um, actually op you do fasting, that you you actually open up these arteries is com is just unheard of. What do you think sprinting does? Um, sprinting, uh, it, it's actually been studied in the context of myokines. So myokines are these messaging molecules. I'm sure you're, you're aware of them. And they tell your body uh, to burn fat and build muscle. 
So in 10 different forms of exercise, uh, they looked at myokine production. And they used, uh, actually, I think, uh, mass spectrometry. So that what they did in this particular study was they said, well, let's just see what it gets created. And uh, there was a, a molecule, messaging molecule called uh, LACV, which is a combination of uh, lactate and phenylalanine that goes combined. And uh, the one form of exercise that increased uh, the myokines the most was sprinting. So sprinting, number two, resistance training, lifting weights, right underneath sprinting. And at the very bottom was uh, studied was running. So sprinting just produces molecules inside your body um, to help you build uh, build muscle. And I think this, uh, maybe this was- Some of this can sometimes- This guy be. right here, this is a sprinter, Olympic mm -hmm. sprinter, Emmanuel Matati. This is before he lifted weights, Mark. Mm -hmm. This guy got this jacked. Uh, and I didn't believe him. I'm like, no, you don't get muscles like that without lifting weights. But he he said, no, I've never lifted weights. And so I checked with his um, his like friends from high school, and they said, no, he never lifted weights. He got he got that jacked just from sprinting. Yeah, sprinting's tremendous demand on the body. But some people might get confused by some of this information. You know, uh, walking. You know, hear people talking about walking burning fat and zone two cardio burning fat, which it's true. Those, those things do oxidize fat at the moment. And when you sprint, sprinting is usually more of a glycolytic activity, but after sprinting is when your body starts to really tap into those fat stores and you're gonna burn way more fat from, uh, exactly. from, from doing sprints. And then also the signal to the body. We can't forget the cascade of catabolic things that get sent to the body. Uh, if you spend time uh, running too much, you, you you run 90 minutes, two hours at a time. And again, we also have to mention that there are people that do adapt, that do get used to these things that can probably, if given certain athletes can get away with certain things because they've just been doing things for a long time, but it's still good to be aware of all those I, things. I would like to um, investigate that. I completely agree with you, Mark. It, I think it's fascinating. Some people seem to be able to... Um, to adapt to uh, distance running without that problem. But if you look at the majority of people that are distance runners and they get to in their 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. 80s, and particularly uh, world champion level marathoners, they're really emaciated and atrophied um, and uh, c compared to the, to the sprinters. And they can do a lot of damage to their heart as well. Yeah, so you're exactly right. And uh, in fact, uh, there's a the cardiologist that warning about distance running, Dr. Um, James O'Keefe, and uh, he spends a, a lot of time talking about a, a fib, atrial fibrillation, mm -hmm. being associated with distance running. And so what we have found in our studies is when people did a lot of distance running, uh, it made it um, uh, made them very refractory to uh, losing like uh, this guy right here. This guy was a distance runner. He had a sizable amount of visceral fat inside of him. And he was doing 10 miles a day, five days a week. And then we told him... Uh, you know, stop that distance running. He did no other changes. And in two months, he substituted sprinting in. And then look at the dramatic wow, yeah. uh, elimination of his visceral fat. And his muscle, he, he developed a six pack. Um, and the, the this was evident on his body before he got scanned. The technician came back, Sean, Sean, I think this guy's taking steroids. He's so jacked. <laughs> so I had to ask him, please don't mess with our science. Are you taking steroids? Because he did, he was visibly jacked in two months from when he was before. And he said, nope, nope. I just did what you told me. I stopped uh, running and I started sprinting. Now, I will say this to you, Mark. I do not believe the average person, no way, is going to get this jacked <laughs> if they just start sprinting. But what this guy did was he stopped all the distance from running. So I think there's something there, like a rebound effect. When you pull back on that distance running, and maybe it's the excessive reactive oxygen species that get um, that start accumulating when you do a lot of distance running, and then you stop that, and you, you go to the lesser form of ROSs that get produced when you sprint, because this guy was only sprinting. Uh, 10, uh, he's doing six sprints for about 10, 10 to 15 seconds, uh, five times a week. It could be possible. Some people are pretty suppressed, you know, because they exercise so much. So his mm -hmm. muscle maturity and things like that might have been suppressed or kind of locked behind all that mileage of running that he was doing. Yeah. And once he freed himself of that, he could, you know, gain. Yeah. 
I think uh, that kind of a rebound, he he had that uh, ability to uh, to eliminate that. So uh, a significant inch. But when, when we started learning this, and you could also see too, his uh, deep subcutaneous fat re- was reduced mm-hmm. compared to where it was before. So um, the other way, these love handles, you could think of as kind of like a poor man's MRI. You know, so you got love handles um, it gives you an indication you have visceral fat. When you get rid of that visceral fat, those love handle, the the, the more deleterious portion of it, mm-hmm. the deep subcutaneous fat was eliminated, but is superficial uh, uh, adipose t- tissue where the adiponectin was pretty largely preserved. And so that's what we try to do. We develop strategies to maintain that superficial level of uh, adiponectin-rich uh, sub-Q, superficial sub-Q fat. Uh, while eliminating visceral fat and losing that uh, deep sub-Q fat. So when you get an MRI, this is the level of uh, optimization. And I would love guys and girls in the weightlifting, bodybuilding community, kudos to you. You've done awesome in making people realize that they don't have to be couch potatoes. But could we get some men and women to start doing MRIs and bring fidelity, amplification to what they're doing and looking at their muscle-to-fat ratios on the inside instead of just on the outside. It is time we, you know, I would love to bring some maturity and growing up and optimization to to this exciting world. I mean, it's fantastic. Uh, But yeah, this is one area you asked me about um, things that that trouble me. This is this is kind of a bugaboo for me. That bodybuilders are uh, focusing in on just the, um, the outward appearance of muscle and weightlifting. I mean, it's important. You got to perform well. But um, I think we could we could get weightlifters to live way longer and way better if we had them educated to track uh, these other biomarkers marbleization of their 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 muscles and deep sub q fat uh trying to get a few <laughs> i know it's gonna be hard because it's like change uh because there's so many people you want to see that shredded look in but, these uh in these images and and just in mris in general are you able to see when there's fat around the liver are you able to see when there's fat around these different organs the heart and so on yeah yeah so we um uh, i don't know Andrew, that could be the real a, danger right uh, yeah, if we can show uh, some more, can we get some other scans up there, uh, Andrew? Some other uh, um, a little, little little further down. That's uh, oh wait, right, right there is kind of a um, this is an interesting one. These are legs. So um, oh yeah, I've seen you pull these up on your Instagram before. Yeah, so a seventy four year old, very little marbleization. Forty year old, very little marbleization. This seventy four year old marbleization going on. But wow. the, the, the other interesting thing is, Mark, look at his, uh, the femurs here, okay? Bone shows up as black on an MRI mm. and fat shows up as white. So there's the bone marrow inside those those uh, femurs. Um, and they're both thick. The 74-year-old's bones are as thick as the 40-year-old's, but that's this 74-year-old in the middle, um, their bone is so thin. And this is the story of the elderly today, and unfortunately, um, who uh, have their bones start to thin, and then they they get this spontaneous femur fracture. They're in their their kitchen in their slippers, and then they just fall to the ground. And what's happened is their femur snaps because you can see how incredibly thin this is. It also looks like it has fat within it. Is that right? Yeah, there's and you very astute. So there is fat from bone marrow. But what, what's happened, if you look at that ratio, and this is where the MRI is really cool, you can look at the ratio of the fat, the white to black, and they're mm-hmm. pretty proportional here. But in this one, way more white relative to black. So just like your muscles, you want to be more black to, to white. And the same thing with your bones here, it's more white to black, not only just in the muscle, but also in the bone. And so what happens is the bone starts thinning from the inside out. And so you have this uh, gradual uh, d- decline of your, your bone strength. And this is the mortality of this uh, at the age of 85. If you fracture one of these bones, is 95%. But check this out. It's not because the bone is fractured. It's because the level 
of diseasing. That term I just came up with, instead of aging, diseasing. You've accumulated so much disease by the time you're 85. And if you spontaneously fracture one of those bones, your mortality is 95% with that type of event. But if you take this same person, I have 80-year-olds that I take care of. If I smack that with a good hit from a sledge and I break that femur, they'll be just fine because they haven't diseased. They've recovered. They've preserved. Um, I wish, uh, I, I don't think that's uh, this 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 one, but... Um, yeah, I have an 80-year-old with really thick bones. Um, this this is a guy who who lost uh, all that visceral fat in three months. And the, I'm glad I clicked on this because here's your heart scan. You asked about fat around the heart. See that big chunk of weight uh, around the heart uh, there, Mark? That is uh, cardial fat or ectopic fat. It's fat with uh, surrounding the the heart. It's like a big chunk of inflammatory fat up against all your coronary arteries, which are not inside your heart. They're on the outside. So when you have a bypass surgeon, CT surgeon, they have to um, th- transplant those. It's it's all buttressed up there. But look, in, in three months, look how much he reduced his heart fat by reducing his visceral fat. So that's a significant um, reduction in... Um, uh, in their in their in their fat, dangerous visceral fat and hard fat. Can I ask um, a quick question? Sure. Um, I quickly want to ask a question that uh, Mark asked because you mentioned like zero visceral fat is ideal, of course. Um, but you know, a lot of the pictures you've pulled up have people that have gone maybe from three pounds to one pound, and that's good that, that they lost that. But um, what is a number? Obviously, you don't want to have any, but what's a number where like you can be less concerned? Like, okay, you're okay. Three pounds is probably you're in trouble. Great One question. pound, it's probably I'm assuming you want to lose it, but you're all right, right? So every everybody's going to have a different number. Okay, you know, is there a general it's, <clears throat> generalization? You know, you you know, it's it's really hard to answer that. But if you you're going to live a pretty quality life, mm-hmm. if you get it below one pound. Okay. If you can get your visceral fat below one pound. If you gun to my head, you want a number, <coughs> cough out less than one pound. But you're that same person, maybe with 14 ounces of visceral fat, still could have a heart attack versus, you know, somebody that has <clears throat> more visceral fat because here's what it turns on. You have long how long you had that visceral fat for. So if you just, you know, if I take um I take a bunch of visceral fat and dump it, uh, dump it inside a mark. He's not gonna, um, he's not gonna feel a, a, a huge change on that. But over a period of time, that all those molecules gradually, those those black-hatted horsemen with their guns will gradually start deteriorating you, and you'll be like, I don't know what the hell is going on. My body is really falling apart over, over the last year. So slowly, it starts to to uh, affect you. So it's the exposure to visceral fat, not the mere presence. And the other interesting thing is, let's just say I take, you know, average one of my clients that comes to me is in bad shape with visceral fat and open them up and take all that visceral fat out, close them back up. They will feel no change for a significant period of time because it's, the damage has been done over a period of time. Now, the interesting thing is kids, and I've scanned kids as young as four, um, I've had clients this year that brought a four-year-old to me, and we we scanned them. They had they had visceral fat. So kids are uh, even you know based on how many waffles and pancakes and cereal sugary cereals they eat in the morning, will have visceral fat start to form. And then uh, I don't have it with me, but I have uh, my kids that um, grew up in a in a deprived. Uh, <laughs> You know, household where they just ate meat and cheese, cheesy omelets, and and uh, and and stuff in the morning for breakfast, and they had like, and in, in like no visceral fat. They're just gorgeous uh, organs and fat inside. Of fact, uh, um, if you could scan, maybe I'll show you a good example. Um, uh, maybe right there. Whoop, that's it. So check out this MRI. So see how dark this is. So. This person is has got a very low amount of visceral fat. They got a nice abdominal shape. Okay, that's like like an oval shape. That's like you guys and the sagittal abdominal diameter that we talked about with Joe Rogan being more elevated and protuberant, very small. So um, this person, 
uh, I'd like to say, well, this is one of my clients and I got rid of all their visceral. No, this isn't even a client. This was somebody I found on the internet and uh, we'll pull up her picture. She's on Instagram and I found her and I became very interested in her from a researcher standpoint because she is nice. <laughs> you clarified that. <laughs> purely like, science. Purely scientific. <laughs> <laughs> she's going to enjoy this podcast. <laughs> so she's got a uh, healthy looking leg and very nice, healthy torso. And uh, she's got an attractive face and an elegant uh, uh, elegant arm. And the, the, her story is, this is Karen LeBoucher and she's got... Um, 600,000 followers. She's a model. And she has this attractive figure. She's 59, 59 years old. And the reason why she looks this way at age 59, she's never had visceral fat. So you ladies listening, the pretty girl in your class that was always pretty, oftentimes uh, they, they turn out not so attractive later in life. But Carolyn has always stayed attractive because she went on uh, a low-carb diet way back in the 60s, I think it was Atkins when she went back in the 60s. Only her mom and dad never went off Atkins, unlike my mom and dad, where we went low carb and then we followed the government that told us it's fat is the problem. Stop eating fat and eat all the carbs we want. And then we fell apart. But Carolyn uh, didn't fall apart. So it's um, the lack of influence of visceral fat in that. And here, I think, is my 60-year-old. Okay, I'm sorry, 80-year-old, okay? So look how thick this 80-year-old guy's legs are. See how thick that bone is mm -hmm. and their bone marrow? And they really don't have much visceral fat. These white dots are actually not fat. It's uh, from my cell phone taking uh, this artifact from the ceiling lights. So this is an 80-year-old's legs. So they're even older than the 74-year-old and this person eats carnivore, they eat ferments, and they hunt elk. Is there something going on with the femur of the rider? Is that just your phone? Um, no, it it prob it could be artifact, but there it could also very interesting. You pick up on that, um, and I need to go back to the to the radiologist. It might be red bone marrow that's coming back. Very very often we we do not see this at this age, but as you become this guy has been carnivore longer than I have. Mm -hmm. This guy's eighty. Um, 80 years old. So he's he's very healthy and he's an elk hunter, sprinter, sprints up mounds. But when he's, we talked about being really effective, this guy's full-time job, he's chairman of board of a national bank. Chairman of board of a bank. This guy's a real financial, you know, badass, uh, great hunter. And he literally is a hunter, teaches guys how to hunt elk. So I would not be surprised if we're, we're actually being able to see a little... Uh, red marrow, which is more in line with what we see in optimally healthy uh, people. And who do we see that in? Young people. Mm -hmm. So I tell my clients, if you want to see what you look like without disease, look at your kids. And I tell my kids, the, my ki the, the kids of my clients, you want to see what you look like with disease? Look at your parents. So one, one interesting story I will tell about my son, Aiden. Aiden is 18. He'll be starting Texas A&M. So he's, he's top of his class, doing really good in school, the best high school in Minnetonka, big jack guy. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's now 18, and he wrote his college entrance exam for to go to college. And I said, would you write your, uh, your essay on? I was just curious. He goes, well, I actually wrote it on your practice. I'm like, what? Hmm. Would you write it on, my, on your practice? Listen to his answer. He goes, I wrote it, what it was like to grow up in a house with a, with a dad that has this health optimizing practice and how all these older people came to you with all this disease and how they got better when you told them what to do and start changing their lives. And he said, at the age of 14, I wrote about how I decided that wasn't going to happen to me. I'm just going to start living this way and never get diseased. That's what we need to do in America. We need to teach younger people that they can live healthy and not have disease. So that 14-year-old kid figured it out. So if you're listening today, the answer to try to get your kids healthy is get yourself healthy. Yeah. Model it. Let them become attracted to the fact that you uh, are, are healthy and you, you, you can't talk them into it. You just got to make it look attractive. And uh, I think that's, what, that's, that's the mission of America. What you got going on over there, Andrew? Yeah. Um, so if somebody finds this 
podcast, they will at least be aware of like what visceral fat is. But you're right. It's not talked about like at all, really. So the thought of like, oh, shit, I already have 50 pounds to lose of fat. Now I have a different fat I need to focus on. It's already hard enough to lose fat as is right now. Yeah. Um, like I, I, you know, we we talked about a little bit before um, about like calories in, calories out. Like you know, we can argue that all day long, but there is somewhat of a um, like a blueprint for losing body fat, right? Uh, if we can keep it super elementary, we'll just do the uh, the calories in, calories out thing. We consume a little bit less, and we output a little bit more. Just to keep it elementary, just so that way we have an example of a way of losing body fat. When it comes to visceral fat, we've heard you say stuff about fermented foods. Um, what else? Uh, sprinting. I think sprinting, sunlight, that sort of stuff. But is there like, and I don't want to say like a, your protocol, but like what what's the guide for somebody to follow in order to focus on visceral fat like it can it be similar to just dropping body fat because it's sort of like there's a bit of a uh, uh again losing body fat is already difficult now i gotta lose visceral fat it seems like it's like this is like level one is already really difficult now how do i get past level two like this seems almost impossible if i can't even figure out this first one kind of such a great question andrew um a loaded one a lot of lot going on in there. Super good though, because you know what? Every probably the majority of followers are like, "Damn, that was a good question. That guy's awesome. That was a great question." So here's my response because I've thought about this for 13 years. So I'm going to turn on my. Uh, I'm still a lieutenant colonel in the Army National Guard. I'm going to turn on my military hat to try to explain this. Um, when it comes to a research perspective, researchers, people like me who are researching how to optimize human health. We look at two measures for trying to determine if a study is helpful. It's called signal and noise. Signal is that part of what we're looking at that really matters. Noise is what is a distraction. So let me hit it home. In a military analogy, if we're looking to try from a military objective to destroy and eliminate missile launchers, we could look for every tree with all these leaves because missile launchers can hide behind trees and we can destroy all the trees. But our ability to focus and really get on that target is going to be substantially hampered because there's a lot of distraction, a lot of noise in that, just looking at leaves. Real signal is seeing those bad boys on satellite imagery. And we see them in a field, we take them out. So when it comes to optimizing people, helping to lose weight. Don't, when you're just losing weight, you're looking at a lot of noise. And you could lose a lot of weight and not get healthy. Oprah. Oprah's gone up and down, up and down, up and down. Because nobody's told her about signal. Looking at visceral fat in particular and optimizing your microbiome. So my best answer to, to that excellent question is add some fidelity We'll focus on what's really going to matter, what will really help get the job done, take out those missile launchers. Um, you, If you want to be healthy, you want to experience a better quality of life, then get rid of that visceral fat and don't pay attention to a, a bathroom scale on your weight. Because I've had clients that have gone in, I remember this one guy's a firefighter, about 35 years old, Jack guy. Uh, he came in, we scanned him, he worked so hard and he never lost weight. And when we showed him his MRI scan, I looked at a grown man, 35, who started bawling because he saw inside. He had lost all his visceral fat and he grew muscle. So while he, has, he was weight neutral, he optimized his human body. And so that's, that's the, the fidelity that uh, an MRI can bring to help you understand. So if you want to be investing in that the things get back to Mark's question. I recommend is meat microbes, eat fermented foods, uh, build Noah's Ark inside of you where you are eating small amounts of a variety of fermented foods. If you think you're going to improve your microbiome by eating one damn jar of kimchi over and over and over again, <laughs> you're not. It will help a little bit, but it's the man and woman that's enlightened to understanding that the microbiome is a damn 
African safari. There are so many species in there mm -hmm. and they live in, symbi in a symbiotic relationship and it all has to be in balance. And so just eating one jar of kimchi ain't gonna bring diversity mm -hmm. to your safari. So eat nose arc when it comes to fermented foods and do some fasting. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, we didn't really talk a lot about fasting, but fasting breeds and improves autophagy. And autophagy is another word like adiponectin that big pharma doesn't want you to know about because you become awesome when you increase your autophagy. How long of a fast? Um, I have been fasting. I get my clients very slowly to increase it um, over a period of time because if the last thing, Mark, such a good question. The last thing I want to do is have somebody start a fast and do too much and they get discouraged and they they blow off this one amazing ability, you know, this amazing uh, health optimizing strategy of autophagy. And so I slowly worked myself up over 13 years that I do three or four days of fasting a week, every week. When I'm you fasting. Say fasting, do you mean fasting all day or you mean like a 12 or 16 hour? We're, we're talking 72, 96 hours, zero calorie. Oh, okay. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's basically, it's watered down, uh, you know, teeny tiny fast compared to our ancestors. We would Sounds like you fast almost every other day. Is that right? Um, well, it's, I do, I, I literally fast for, you know, three to four days straight. Uh. So I'm doing 72 to 96 hours straight, no calorie, and then get out of my way when I'm, when I'm recovering, I'm eating some, some size of my meat. So I think. And I call it feasting, fasting. Do not do this, ladies and gentlemen. This is, where I, this is about 13 years of uh, me doing this, but I'm working my way up to trying to be what our ancestors would have done, uh, woolly mammoth consumption of meat. And uh, I'm trying to, you know, I can eat eight pounds of meat in a single day. I stretch my stomach to be able to do that. <laughs> and uh, But that's nothing. I mean, you got women that are reading those Texas uh, brisket contests and hot dog eating contests. They do 20. <laughs> And 22 pounds. So eight, eight pounds ain't nothing to to uh, to really boast about. But I'm stretching it and uh, I fast and then then I feed. And if you think about those bariatric patients, Mark, those morbidly obese, my 600-pound life, um, they have enormous stomachs. They stretch and they can eat, you know, uh, 10, 20 pounds of uh, pizza and ice cream. What would a human being look like that just ate 10 to 20 pounds of meat? And nothing else instead of putting bad processed foods in. Sean Baker. Um, I don't think Sean uh, eats that much. I think Sean eats like uh, four like or five, five pounds. pounds. Yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. think he eats all that much, but you know, shout out to Sean. Dude looks 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 good. I'd love to see Sean doing some some more extended fasting, but Sean is um is also you know, training to, you know, be a world level um, champion and, and is uh, rowing and things. And uh, so um, that's, that's going to be a different thing, like world level, level uh, sprinters and stuff that mm -hmm. those, those kind of achievers, um, it comes when you're, when you're wor the world's best in something, um, you might be best in the world, but it may not be the best for your species in terms of how you want to live. So it, it all comes at a, at a price when you want to be that competitive. So, I, I'm very interested. I'd like to see DOD, Department of Defense, um, really specialize and, and concentrate from a biological perspective, start researching what do we got to do to create superhumans? And I'm fascinated by this. I'd like to create superhumans that perform uh, incredibly well and create super soldiers, basically. Um, and then also model that for um, humanity. I mean, I think we're... We have never seen the amount of disease that we see today. 100,000 years ago, if the five of us showed up with our ancestors 100,000 years, they would look at us, start screaming and running for the hills. It'd be like, there's no way I'm touching those dudes because they're so unhealthy relative. We're so unhealthy relative to them. Mm. So we've lost um, sight of our species ability to detect minute changes uh, you know, how we start to deteriorate and how we how, how we could detect change when we improve. And that's why young people go and they flex in the gym. They see a muscle pump after just doing you know, 15 minutes of working out uh, or a 30-minute workout or hour and a half workout, they're flexing. That's nature telling them to see the change. So they go back 
can do it again the next day. And the 60-year-old and 70-year-old fill of visceral fat who doesn't get that post-muscle uh, pump uh, work, work workout, that mm-hmm. pump, uh, they don't see that change. And so they don't go back and do it again. But that's what we need to do. We need to pick up on little tiny changes. And uh, I see it in my kids if they go out sprinting. I see it in their face. If they do a sauna, I can see it in their face. Um, if they, they fast, even clients, um, you can de- 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 you can detect minute changes from um, being awesome, like the visible pulse thing. I go out in the sunshine, the the magnitude of that pulse, I'm not talking the speed, you know, it's not like it goes faster, but the magnitude, you know, like, a, you know, to use a bigger erection, you know, pull. that pulse gets bigger if I go on the sunshine from nitric oxide. Yeah. So when I go out there, uh, I'm very encouraged by going out in the sun. Guess what uh, happened to Sean O'Meara and Medicals? Very discouraged about going in the sun because they said you're going to cause disease, start falling apart. It's going to burn. So now when I go in the sun, I see that blood flow. I'm like, oh, damn. That's going now to my brain, my heart, my kidneys, my mm. liver, way better. And so that encourages me to go out in the sunshine. And where else does it happen? The sauna. And when I sprint, I lift weights and get, a, you know, much more nitric oxide production. And so I'm encouraged to go back and do it again. The other one is uh, fasting, when I fast. Now, Paul, Paul Saladino, God bless him, another physician way smarter than me. He advocates, and he. Paul, I went on Paul's podcast a couple of years ago. He have talked me into doing honey, so I do this little experiment with honey. When I took the honey twice, it made my pulses disappear for like a day, day and a half. They completely went away, <laughs> and I never. It was like I'd lost my shirt or something. I always have my pulses, and so the consumption of that that honey actually uh, decreased and 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 eliminated my. My visible pulses. Do you think that that would be an individual type thing? Because I I know like, you know, like there are certain athletes who, and I don't think that you need excessive amount of carbohydrates, but athletic populations, usually like they'll have some carbohydrates. And once they go exercise, like, you know, I know Bill Maeda, he's like 55 years old. He gets a little bit of carbs in the system. His body just like balloons and in a good way, like you can see his veins and all that type of stuff. So what are your thoughts on that? I do. No, that's a great question. So I think it's the microbiome. Mm. So I had eliminated so many, um, uh, d- driven my species of microbes into fat and protein um, consumption mm-hmm. that carbohydrates being introduced just, um, I didn't have good healthy microbes okay. to handle that microbiome. But I would be interested in, um, uh, in, in acquiring, it would be interesting to study and see what happens. The other answer to to po- Paul Saladino, if he listens to this podcast, somebody forwards it to him, is uh, Paul uh, eats like two or 300 grams of carbs. You know, he went from carnivore, like zero carb <laughs> um, to, to this, you know, hundreds of uh, grams of carbs. And uh, the my interesting observation is uh, he serves for three hours, but a day, two to three hours a day. Mm-hmm. But I'm a surfer too. I don't surf too much anymore, <laughs> but uh, my lifestyle, but I grew up surfing. And uh, one of the things I um, observe is that you almost never see, you never see a dedicated surfer that's a heavy guy. Mm. So here's what's going, here's my opinion. The microbes in the ocean. You go down, you, you're going to swallow water. Paul is swallowing a lot of ocean water. He's probably got a very optimized microbiome. So Paul is telling these people to take, you know, honey and all these other things, but they're, he's not telling them to drink the water that I drink because he doesn't know that's going on. But that's what I think. Uh, I think Paul has a, an optimized microbiome like many surfers. Uh, a lot of my surfer friends that continue to surf are just super healthy. Have you ever, by the way, um, done anything with swimmers? Because when you were mentioning like the chlorinated water, it made me think about, because good swimmers aren't usually getting that much, ingesting that much water when they're breathing. But sometimes you take an odd stroke here and there, you're going to ingest some chlorinated water, right? Yeah. More than most people would because like that water has a bunch of chlorine in it. It's always touching your skin. Right? So. Like, like, is there, have you had, or do you know anything about those types of- I, No, those are great questions. And Mike, to, to, to add to that, what I've noticed, is uh swimmers look really good like mark spitz and stuff when they're younger 
um, but then when they get older, they they seem to have a lot of uh, atrophy, like they've lost um, a lot of their muscle mass, um, even though a lot of them continue to do master level you know, swimming. Mm -hmm. And so my thought is exactly that. I think chlorine is disrupting their microbiome. And here's, you know, we we do all these studies, right, on um, on chlorine added to water. Um, and even um, Monsanto studies with glyphosate, they're not doing the studies on the microbiome. Mm. So we don't really see the impact that chlorine is having uh, disrupting the human microbiome, and that's what leads to disease. And so you got scientists out there literally that drink glyphosate because they they're convinced it doesn't you know doesn't cause any harm on human human cells. But where the problem is, what they're not paying attention to is uh, the delicate, living, beautiful microbes that are inside our microbiome. So brilliant question. Um, that's what we got to start doing. We got to start looking at your most important physical asset that you'll ever own is your body because nothing else will impact um, the quality of your life and dictate how much you're going to enjoy every circumstance or suffer every circumstance in the future than your physical body. And um, the most important aspect to your body is not your visceral fat. It's really your microbiome. But the microbiome becomes kind of an elusive target to try to uh, go after and optimize. The visceral fat is easier to, to, to visualize and see it. The microbiome, you got to do these sequencing studies and uh, um, they're, they're, they're expensive and they're kind of early stage. And I've done a lot of microbiome sequencing. And uh, I just don't find it super healthy, not nearly as much of an ROI to target as uh, as visceral fat. So I think we're, you know, we're just at the early stages of the microbiome understanding. It's the second phase of the Human Genome Project um, that Dr. Craig Vetter launched uh, probably, you know, 20, 30 years ago and completed probably now 15 years ago. Uh, and we're going to be looking at all of those uh, species of microbes, of which there are 70 trillion estimated uh, microbes inside of us. And we know v precious little about them and what they do. Mm -hmm. And we have ten, about 10 trillion human cells. So we get a lot of work to catch up when it comes to the microbiome. But don't uh, – Peter Atia um, says it's just too complicated and he doesn't spend enough – you know, doesn't worry about it because it's too complex. Well – I reject Peter's position on that. I think, you know, cut out processed foods, go do sunshine, you know, do a sauna, do cold plunge, do some fasting, do some sprinting, do uh, resistance training. Um, those uh, have have good quality sexual relations, uh, swap microbes. All these things uh, will optimize your microbiome and don't wait, don't wait for the man to figure it out. Get going on your life. Get going on living, living better, so that you, you know, you invest in your future. Where can people find you? Um, best place to find me uh, is social media um, at just that earlier handle D R S E A N O M A R A, and uh, I have a website also D R S E A N O M A R A dot com. I'm on X, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube. Uh, Instagram uh, and uh, and TikTok, uh, all all under the same name. And uh, if uh, any of this makes sense, and you are a motivated person, you want to um, come, and you're able to afford MRIs. Everybody wants to come. So, well, you study me for free. I don't own an MRI scanner. I can't study you for free. <laughs> so, unless you can afford to have these MRIs, I can't. Uh, I can't. I can't follow you. But uh, if you got money. Uh, uh, quit losing your health. Um, come get motivated. We'll study, figure out, you know, how to optimize you and uh, use those MRIs. But um, yeah, I I love to do podcasts. And Mark, thank you so much for thank having you. me on your, your show. It's appreciate great, it. uh, great to be here and talk about visceral fat. And I appreciate uh, the opportunity to educate you. Thanks for on the spreading show. some fecal matter my way. Too. <laughs> yeah, <Thank you>. yeah, <laughs> <man>. yeah. <laughs> um, it's about 250 bucks for people that are uh, looking into getting an MRI. So 
Um, I don't think that's uh, too much to ask when you're trying to invest in your health. So it might be something to look into. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later.